Welcome to the Black Doctor Talk podcast. I am Dr. Christopher Holmes, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I am joined by Dr. Kenneth Harris Jr., who is a retired law enforcement officer, administrator, professor, and public servant, and also radio host. We'll get into that a little bit later, but welcome, Dr. Harris. Good day. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Um, so let's jump right in. First, I want you to start by telling our viewers and our listeners a little bit about your background. Where does it all begin for you? Uh, I was born in a galaxy far, far. Oh, I'm sorry. That's 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 the wrong story. Uh, born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, graduate of Illinois State University. Uh, went into radio and TV. Absolutely love it. Been in it since I was about 17 years old. I won't tell you how many years because that'll show my age. But I, I absolutely loved it. But I always had a calling for law enforcement, for public service. And so after working in radio and TV for a number of years, experience included a lot of freelance for uh, Warner Brothers and 60 Minutes and Fox Sports and CBS Sports. And I mean, all over the place, uh, WGN Radio, Tribune Company, and I decided that I think my calling right now is law enforcement. So I moved from Chicago to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was 28 years ago. Now I'm a retired lieutenant from the uh, city of Milwaukee Police Department, do a lot of consulting. But I'm also, I also decided that one of the most important things that I did is if I could just teach it, no matter where I go, then I was blessed enough to be able to do whatever I wanted to do. And so uh, in, in radio and TV, I taught at Columbia College. In law enforcement, I taught at the academy, uh, and now I'm an associate dean. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an assistant dean, promoting myself already. <laughs> assistant dean for Concordia University in their Batterman School of Business. And I uh, went back and got my second bachelor's, two MBAs, uh, got a PhD, you know, in, in one way to show that when I grew up in Chicago, that's who I was around. I grew up in a, even though I was a single family, you know, single parent, I grew up in a in a in an area that had doctors and lawyers, and it was it was middle class on the south side of Chicago. And so I I, I always knew I wanted to go to college. I always knew that was the most important thing. But one of the great things, and I know, Dr. Holmes, you talked about the fact that the great equalizer in America is education. Yeah. And so that's one of the things I did. Moved here, absolutely love it at Concordia, and moved up from a contract to assistant professor to associate professor. And now I'm an assistant dean. So absolutely love it. So let's let's go back a little bit. Uh oh. So, <laughs> radio TV. Yes. And you said, I want to go back and I want to be a public servant. Right. Um, what did you take away from that experience? What I can take away is that I've been able to use innate talent that I, that was given to me from my parents, right? So I believe that everybody has innate things that they do. If you if you have children, you can see things that they do. You know, usually the things that irritate you because they have the same habits you have. <laughs> and, and you're able to see those things that have been passed down from my mother, from my father that I do. Those are the things that gave me my strength to be able to, to, to be able to talk publicly, to be able to share myself authentically, that a lot of people may not have that that strength or that that characteristic, I happen to have it. So I was able to use that. Even today, I now host a uh, afternoon drive time, all black talk radio station. I started January 4th here in Milwaukee on 1017 The Truth. So, so, so I've been blessed to use my characteristics in everything I do as a public information officer for the police department. So I basically spoke for the chief in every single media aspect. So it wasn't that I had to learn it. It was an aid. I've just been blessed to be able to apply it in radio, TV, and law enforcement. And on the back end, I've been able to help other people understand the nuances of both of those areas. So since I have you here, sir, as a retired officer, uh -huh. let's, let's go a little bit deeper into uh, where we are now here with policing in America. Um, just what is your stance on where we are with policing on Black Americans here, and what can we do to try to better these relationships that exist in some of these impoverished communities? There are some things we have to take into consideration. <clears throat> Number one, there's no there's no broad way to help police community relations any more so than there's a broad way to educate people. 
everybody has their own way of learning, their own strengths, their own weaknesses. And so we have to we have to adjust education to the students so they can learn. But we have to do the same thing with policing and the public. I think what people forget, and I know people say, oh, you're pro-cop and you're pro-this. And I think what happens is confirmation bias plays a really huge part in, I believe cops are bad. So every time I hear something, I'm going to believe it, right? right? What they don't do is go all the way through the case, all, all the way through court. And if they start to mistrust the, ju the judicial process, then they blame it on, well, you know, it's already fixed. Well, it's not fixed. Those same laws have been around for everybody for the last hundred years. You know, instead of changing the law, let's work on changing our behavior. I think one of the things is that the majority of impoverished neighborhoods, people don't commit crime. That it all but four instances, I believe, those officers that shot African-American men went to jail. I think what we have to recognize is that all life is precious. And I know that's not a really cool thing to say right now in terms of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. They do. We have to recognize that all homicides are bad. Right. Right? Who does it? So if you're going to complain about the police who may or may not have done it and you don't have all the information, you don't have all of the, the, the things uh, that you need in order to come to a decision, then we have to look at Black males killing Black males as well. We have to look at the women and the children that are killed by random violence in my hometown of Chicago, which is completely out of control. Um, to give you an example of that, in a suburb of Milwaukee, there's a story out today that talks about a third party who videotaped the police officer on a traffic stop, take a plastic bag and throw it in the back seat of the car. That officer instantly got accused of planning evidence. It went viral, right? 95,000 shares. What did the police department do? They released the video. As he's searching the guy, he comes up and he looks at the plastic bag and it's empty. And he goes, well, I'm not going to carry this. And he tosses it. It's his bag, right? He tosses it in the backseat of the car. This guy's bag. But by now, everybody has started. Oh, my God, it's terrible. This is why police reform has to happen. Well, you don't have all the information. Right. That's commonly called common sense justice. It makes sense. So therefore, it must be right. Mm -hmm. Even though the statutes and the laws and the ordinances say something different. I think people have a have a misnomer that that all cops are bad. And sometimes cops have this this issue that all black people are bad and neither one of them is true. Anytime you commit crime and you hold people in your community and they can't go out and they can't you know, protect themselves, you probably need to go to jail. If you're a bad cop and you kill someone or you hurt someone or you injure someone, you should be fired and you should be prosecuted. But there's a limit. And the limit is we have to follow the law. Yeah. You can't get mad and just change the law because we don't like the police because now you're not gonna have any police. So if you remove certain things, cops are not gonna be cops anymore. And the only place that's going to be uh, detrimental is all those impoverished areas where now there's nobody to help them when they call 911. So you talk a lot about this um, idea of this miscommunication or the lack thereof of any type of communication. How do we get people to think differently about the police, especially since they're not getting all the information they really need to make it good sound judgments? Be patient. Be patient. Uh, there are an inordinate amount of people who have trusted the system and made it than those that have not. Um, and I'm not saying that the system is perfect by any means, but it's the best system in the world. And we have to understand it better. So I think, I think schools need to do a better job of stop teaching people social studies and start teaching them civics, mm -hmm. how it works, about how the government works, about how the civil process works, about how criminal justice works. And so that if you don't put yourself in the system, that's one thing, you know, it's easy not to get into the criminal justice system, don't do anything wrong. And, 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 and believe me, I've gone to court and testified against police officers who went to jail. So I'm not afraid of that. I think the issue comes is, is building trust. The public has to understand that law enforcement is not changing. We'll say all the stuff, right? But in the end, 
The state statutes, like here in Wisconsin, 165 and 175, tell us exactly what we're supposed to do. We're, you know, we well, we don't we don't like the militarization. Yeah, I, I get all that. But that thin blue line you see on that flag, that's exactly what we are. Grandma, grandpa, aunts and uncles, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers are safe today because of that thin blue line. And if you remove that by getting rid of law enforcement. I'm afraid our cities are going to go even worse. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but the communication piece, take time, get to know each other, understand what the law says you can and cannot do. And then I, I know, I know it's weird. Don't do it. <laughs> when, when, when the cops do something wrong, prosecute them and send them to jail. Not every cop that's arrested and prosecuted should go to jail just like every human being who is accused of a crime should go to jail, Yeah. right? Let the process work. Again, I go back to being patient, but let people know. Now we can't let you know everything because if, if, if Dr. Christopher Holmes gets arrested, but he's not charged, there's no reason why his name should be out in the atmosphere when we found out, wow, it really wasn't him and somebody got mad at him and said he did something. Right. Right? That goes both ways. Just because the cop says he, he did something, he or she did something doesn't necessarily make sure, make them guilty. Take your time, listen to what's going on. Now, departments do a really poor job at communicating and releasing information. And they hide behind this, well, you know, we're, we're in an investigation. Dude, an investigation, don't take that <laughs> what's going on within a day or two you know that that magic point of 48 hours between the time a person is killed and the time you find that person you have about 48 hours where all the information is fresh where you can find them after that start releasing information yeah giving the public what they're asking for and i think it'll help but you know better build that relationship all right so we'll walk away with two things you just told, told us patience and trust yeah patience and trust so let's pivot a little bit. Let's talk now about your work in higher ed. Um, uh -oh. What made you make this transition? Um, I can safely say having taught at the academy, police academy, taught in different courses and work, and taught in higher ed, I've probably put in excess of conservatively three, maybe 400 cops into the system over the last 28 years. Um, Having the opportunity and the honor to make sure that, that some black, white, Hispanic, Asian, male, female person has their head on right when they go out and are reminded that service is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it's about. That's what made me make that transition um, because it was, it was natural. Um, I'm able to, to hire the right people to make sure they have access to practical information. Our program is a little different because it's called justice and public policy and not criminal justice. We have the social sciences, but every single person that's faculty does what they teach. The federal, the, the probation and parole is taught by a federal probation officer. Law enforcement is taught by me. Um, criminal investigation is taught by a sheriff. Um, a lawyer teaches criminal investigation. Oh, you know, all those, you know, all those courses that have to do with the law. They're taught by a lawyer, yeah. a prosecutor, a homicide prosecutor in Milwaukee County for 23 years. So we, we really take a little bit of an effort to make sure whoever has their, that Concordia on their diploma has an opportunity to literally leave as a servant and not just somebody who decides I want to go on a black community and start, you know, jacking people up and right. <laughs> people are doing something crazy. That's uh, that's awesome because that that practical knowledge or by real time practitioners makes a difference in terms of how you communicate the work to the people that are that will be doing that work soon. Um, I love that idea. I think more of that is needed. Um, I used to say that about my graduate program. Like I'm in education. I was like, my professors have never taught. <laughs> Right. Made no sense. Right. But isn't that most universities? Exactly. So at Concordia here in Wisconsin, what we do is 
and, and this this isn't even a humble brag because I went through because I'm an alumni, you know, I'm an alumnus of Concordia. Um, one of the things they do in the school of business, the, the person that teaches actuarial science is the person that did actuarial science, which is way above my pay grade. <laughs> but just the mindset of doing it, the guy that teaches finance worked for either Bear Stearns or Goldman Sachs, you know what I mean? Right. It, they, they tell you this is what you have to do at work, not what the book tells you that you do at work. And so the practical part, I agree with you 100%. It is worth its weight in gold. So let's talk about your students who, who are in your class. What is one thing um, when you're teaching, you see that aha, that light bulb go off, like something connects for them? It, it comes down to giving them the reality of your job. It doesn't matter if you go into probation parole as an attorney, but, but especially because law enforcement is on everybody's mind. You are putting on a uniform and every day you put on a bullet resistant vest, a uniform, a badge and a gun, and you go serve people that don't like you, that many times wish you were dead. And now you've sworn to die for them and they don't even know you. And so when people talk about service, that's what we put into people. It's about service. Yeah. It's about being there. And, and when someone calls 911, they need a uniform, a badge, and a gun. They don't, they don't, they don't need somebody to come talk to them. They don't really care whether or not you've been on the job 20 weeks or 20 years. They need help. And that's the mindset you have to have. That's why sometimes cops feel disconnected. Mm -hmm. That's because they have to be disconnected because once they become emotional, they may lose control because sometimes we've seen things that are so horrendous, but nobody else will go. That's yeah. all us. And we decided we're going to go do this. And so I think sometimes we need to get, I don't like his attitude. Well, I left two baby deaths literally at 12.05 and at 1.30 in the same morning where two babies died. I went home. I told my boss, hey, I got to go home. This is, but that's an everyday occurrence. Yeah. Now over 20 years, eh, that officer might be a little, you know, but you don't know where they came from. We're all, yeah. we all make mistakes. We're just held to a higher standard and we should be. But sometimes you might want to cut a little slack. Yeah. I don't think people think about that, that what you just said, we're not, sure where that cop may have come from before they come to us and so we're looking i don't know what we're looking for this uh, this commercial cop this cartoon character <laughs> i don't perfection. know perfection perfection <laughs> oh, perfect right, wow. I, I remember some days i would i would literally have a 10 o'clock class to teach and i have a nine o'clock meeting with faculty i just left a triple homicide in downtown and I run home, change clothes, you know, take a shower, change clothes, get in the car, drive to a suburb. I come to the university. I sit down. And the most important thing to them is this like one little minor thing that all you have to do is make a decision. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself and my brain is at a triple homicide. Yeah. And, and to think what the families are going to have to go through and what relatives have to go through. And here you are complaining about something so minor in life. Just make a decision and move on. You know, yeah. life is precious, and so those those are the types of things you have to deal with every day. Awesome, yeah. oh, man. We could keep talking, but we got to move. We got to move. All right, I let's love move on. Let's move on. Um, because I could talk about you no, know, are we seeing numbers decline in, in students enrolling who wanted to be cops? Like, where are their mindsets coming in? Like, it's a lot more we can talk about because it's sure. such a prevalent. Um, issue right now and I and I would love for you if we had more time to just give more insight on that side of it because I don't think we hear a lot from cops anymore we don't they're not talking but everybody else is talking for them and right. I think you can provide a powerful voice um, for that side and for that narrative but I do want to talk about this you are first of all you do a lot already but you're very active in Milwaukee very very <laughs> active why is that so important to you um why is it important to me it's, it's important to me because, and, and I like to use example, really practical examples. It's important to me because I'm also a member of 100 Black Men of Greater Milwaukee. The slogan for 100 Black Men is what they see is what they'll be. 
And that's why I do the service. The other night I was honored to be the namesake for the Eagle Scout class. I was, I'm big into Boy Scouts, right? The Eagle Scout class. So they couldn't have one in 2020. So they took all the Eagle Scouts from 2019, 2020, and 2021 up until now. And I was, they named the class after me. And I had to give a speech, right? 270 young men and women who are now Eagle Scouts, right? Awesome. 5% of all Boy Scouts become Eagle Scouts and only 5% of the population is the scouting. That's how small that number is. One black kid. Wow out of all of them. And he was away because he went into the Navy because he wants to be a Naval officer. But, but that's why I do what I do. Wow. That, that if I can just reach one, we love numbers and we love to give away scholarships. So we gave a thousand dollar scholarships to 20 people. Okay, that's 20 grand. Why don't you divide that by four and give it to four over four years and make sure they get out of school? Yeah. You know, those, those are the little things that we have to take care of. If so, if so, if I can make just one, I'm not into the big numbers, just one, mm -hmm. it, go from high school to college, high school to military, high school to a job, and then replicate that every year. Think of what a hundred black men or a hundred women or a hundred PhDs or doctorate level could do if they just picked one kid and over four years made sure they got their I can say kid now. <laughs> you know, think of how the number of PhDs could literally double in five yeah. years, every five years, just like that. Yeah. And so that's why I do what I do. Wow. Um, so in all the things you've done, um, who has had a tremendous impact on you? The person? The person. Uh, the persons. Probably. Well, <laughs> when I was in first grade, there was this position. Actually, in Chicago, I literally, you, you've heard of 4K? Yes. We call that Head Start. Okay. 3K. But they start, when, when it started in Chicago, I was in the first group of kids in the Chicago public schools that started Head Start. And there was this guy that came in, named Charles Smith, who was a police officer called him officer friendly, right? And they went around all the schools and said, hello. I ended up becoming a Boy Scout, a police explorer, and then an Eagle Scout because I knew him. And he knew that I came from a single parent home and he was able to, to give me guidance and wisdom through the years. You know, wanted to buy, got married, wanted to buy a house. What is all this? Where to look, where to go? Things to consider, jobs to do. And that, all we, all we need is that one person, you know, that one person that can be that mentor. And so Chuck Smith was that was that person. Uh, my wife and I just saw him last month. He is 78 years old, you know, and I still keep up with him every couple of months. I still talk to him. He still texts. He still, because without that one person, right, who put me in scouting, that helped me learn, wow, you can do carpentry and electronics and all these other things and figure out that my skill set lie in public speaking and teaching in those areas and public service, I wouldn't be here today. Awesome. So what's one piece of advice that you would give somebody who wants to start in this field of public service? There's an old saying, um, that I think they use in Rotary, service over self. Mm -hmm. And that you have, to, you have to stick to that. That you don't do this. You do this, but well, first of all, make sure it's your calling. Make sure it's something that you'll do in your sleep. You know, my wife always teases me. I do that in my sleep. When I wake up, when I go up, like, when are you not meeting with somebody to help somebody with something? I said, because somebody did it for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody gave me that one kernel that, mm -hmm spark that created, you know, two bachelor's degrees, two masters and a PhD, you know, one person, you know, so that can happen. That's what I want to do. If you want to get into public service, find out what your calling is. That means you have to either go to college or you have to take some type of class or you have to take some type of certificate. You know, free stuff, there's enough free stuff on the internet and mm -hmm. 
to kind of get an idea of what sparks. Make it something that you that you do innately. Don't make it something that you're passionate about. And I know that's opposite of what everybody tells you it's about mm-hmm. passion, right? But when your passion dies, you still gotta go to work. Yeah. And when I don't have passion, I still went to work because that's what I do. Yeah. Service is what I do. If yours is accounting, if yours is programming and coding, then you have to be able to do it even when you're not passionate about it. Yeah. Passion, great, but passion wanes. Yes. But if you put service into everything that you do, if you know that you're doing programming because you're serving a particular population or helping them understand what STEM and STEAM is, that's that service piece. Always have service connected to whatever you do, public sector, private sector, and it'll always work. Start be, I guess the the, the characteristics you really need is you need to be um, congenial, but you also need to be humble. You need to show some humility because when you serve others, you're probably serving people that don't have what you have. Yeah. And so you have to always think, lastly, in the back of your mind, how do I make this person feel the way they felt 72 hours prior to me having to come? And that's where you want to go, where they feel safe and secure. Yeah. What would you say is your biggest accomplishment to date? Uh, other than getting a doctorate, I mean, a- accomplishment, personally, it's not personal. It's raising two daughters where, where one is a software engineer at a, I won't say the name of the tech company. If I said, you'd be like, really? <laughs> um, the other one is finishing her master's in clinical psychology to become a psychologist. So girl dad. <laughs> well, yeah, knowing that I'm passing on um, a legacy and that my legacy is secure with success. And they could have graduated from high school and gotten a job, you know, for, for me to get a job and at least get one promotion and then you're good. And for me, that's what success is, you know, making sure what you call success is success, not what everybody else says. Yeah else always looks and it looks great and they look at the money and they look at but if you're not happy none of that matters yeah so we talk about success and accomplishment what has been your biggest challenge um my biggest challenge has been probably something you can relate to when you get a doctorate other people feeling as if they're inadequate yeah like you already have imposter syndrome right wow, I really am a doctorate and like, I can actually say things and people take it at face value as being valid, you know? But that, but that, that fear mm-hmm. that other people have connecting with you, you know? And I, I learned, and someone told me this years ago and I thought, you know, something's wrong with you. Why would you tell me that? That doesn't make any sense. The more educated you become, the less friends you have. Most definitely. I because they don't, they don't speak an academic language. You know, they don't, they don't think, you know, there, there's a time for data and then there's a time for the qualitative side where I can hear what it is you're saying. And that's where I'm going to get all the richness. You know? Right. It's great. But I want to hear this. You know, I want to hear the story. Like now, this is rich data and people, and I think people miss that. That's been my biggest challenge, helping people understand you can fix all this stuff with a conversation. All the issues in the world all the problems we have in Washington, all the issues we had with, you know, all the, the Republican and Democrat where stuff's going to change every four years anyway. So why are you fighting about it? In the end, have a conversation. And the issue in Washington is a conversation, the issue through the community, the issues with the police and community, because they want to have a conversation. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, we're wrapping up. I, I have one more question for you. Um, and I want you to talk about how your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network has enhanced your career. Hmm. I can honestly say, this is funny, because you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a contrarian at heart, right? It didn't enhance my career. It helps me realize why I have a career. Hmm. So it, it, there are times when people are positioned in places where your job is to enhance Black Doctoral Network that I've gone through and I'm old enough now and I'm mature enough now where 
where I help you enhance your career through Black Doctoral Network, right? Right. It, me being here and being older and being senior and having the experience is what I get out of Black Doctoral Network, to be able to transfer knowledge, mm -hmm. experience, and give it to somebody else because that's some of the things we don't do. Oh, they're a PhD and they've been older and they have tenure and you know all these things, but that's not really where it is. You know, I look at my goal here in the Black Doctoral Network is to answer those questions, to parse through mm -hmm. the issues people have where, and I'll give you a great example. Um, early on, there was this big thing that, you know, everybody's a doctor and everybody's equal. And I'm like, well, actually you're not in academia, you're not. Oh yes, you are. Why are you being a hater? I said, I have a PhD, I'm not a hater. I said, it comes down to a Juris doctor, right? It's a doctorate, but it's a professional degree. Like an MBA, like a, like a dentist, like a medical doctor, right? You're an expert in your field. A PhD, more academic. Yes. So you'll probably get a job quicker with a PhD in certain instances than you may with a JD or whatever, right? That, that's not an argument. That's how academia is set up. So position yourself, go back and get a certificate, go back and get, so that you can get into academia. But if you only have a, a JD, and I'm, I'm just picking on lawyers, if you only have a JD, then you can only teach law. Right. If you go back and get your LLM, right, do some research, you can, you know, the whole criminal justice world opens up to you. Those types of things are, are the things that we need to transfer to people to know how do I position myself to get a job? Or do you need a PhD when a doctor of management or a doctor of accountancy will do the same thing because you're going in the private sector? Mm. You know, helping, helping those nuances is probably the most important thing I see the Black Doctoral Network doing because sometimes <laughs> you got to be in a room with people that look like you. Yeah. And you got to hear from people that look like you, people that are that have the same issues and the same problems and dealing with deans and provosts and and <laughs> hey Coco Ghost is on a podcast. Um, <laughs> with people that believe in equity, diverse, diversity and inclusion, but don't include culture. Yeah. Wow. So having black people is one thing, accepting their culture is a completely different thing. So I could care less about equity, diversity, inclusion. And I say that with quotes, because if you don't accept my culture, you don't accept me. Most definitely. So that's, oh, that's a whole other conversation. You, you really yeah. hit something just <laughs> then. You, you're really trying to make me talk, but I'm not going to do it. But I right. really, on behalf of the Black Dog Tour Network, I would like to say that it is a privilege for us to create a space to have somebody like you to come and do what you are called to do, and that is share information and to help guide people through uh, the things that they want to do in life and that they're called to do in terms of purpose. Um, this has been a wonderful interview. Thank you so much for joining me again today. It has been a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Harris, if you don't mind, could you tell our viewers and listeners where they can go and learn more about you and the work that you're doing? Uh, you can see me on LinkedIn. I'm under Talented Strategies on LinkedIn. You can just Google Dr. Kenneth Harris Jr., um, and it should pop up. There are quite a few Dr. Kenneth Harris's out there. So, <laughs> now, when you go to right LinkedIn, one, guy, when you go to LinkedIn, you're not going to see all this, okay? No, you're not going to see all this. <laughs> this, this, this is my, my uh, in, in law enforcement, they have a thing for um, um, prostate cancer called No Shave November. Yes. This is from last November. Gotcha. I just kept it. So It looks good on you, brother. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So follow me on LinkedIn and tell them again about the, the show that you're hosting your radio. Uh, 1017 The Truth. They have an app that you can download. And um, with all the issues that went on in 2020 and all the things we had, you know, we've had a, several issues here in, here in Milwaukee with the yeah. park riots, the block from my house and issues in Kenosha, things of that nature. So um, some folks locally, Good Karma Brands decided to, um, they've, they've got stations here all predominantly white stations, you know, 620 WTMJ and all the ESPN stations in Wisconsin and some in Florida. And they decided to kind of put their money where their mouth is. We can talk about it or we can be about it. And so they started um, WGKB FM 1017, The Truth. And we started January 4th and we've been rolling it ever since. And I'm the afternoon drive time host 
4 to 6 p.m. Central Time. They've got an app you can download. All the stuff is on podcasts, on Spotify, Stitcher. Um, so it gives the Black community a voice that they don't necessarily hear. And we've got them from 30 years old to me being 61 years old. And we get every generation and every vibe. And community activists, um, Mel and Joe in the morning, they work for the Milwaukee Bucks. They're, they're the in-house announcers for the Milwaukee Bucks. 30 years old, they're young. They're, they're at that age where they're, they don't know if they millennials or Gen Z <laughs> and all the, you know, and we go back and forth and talk about generational, but it's done in a loving way. And we give the community the opportunity to speak and hear things that they don't necessarily hear every day on predominantly white radio stations. So we're, we're excited. We're here. Check us out. And that's it. Thank you for asking. That's awesome. I want to check you out. I want to check you out today. All right. So, hey guys, so please be sure to stay connected with the Black Doctoral Network as well and join us on all of our social media channels. Thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctor Talk podcast. We hope you will join us again next time. But for now, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and please don't forget to tell a friend. Dr. Harris, thank you again for joining me and have a wonderful day.